you have your Bible, going to be turning to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. We're going we're gonna to start in Isaiah 9. Most of the verses will be up on the screen, but we'll really be in Matthew 5 for the majority of the lesson. We'll bounce around a little bit. Uh, but I guess I'll say this in the, up front. It's a blessing to be with you all. For what it's worth, I'm just going to say this, you know, I'm awkward about introductions. And even back home, every time, like the first two minutes of the lesson are just like, let's just stick with me. I promise once we really get into the lesson, it'll be fine. Uh, but it has been good to be with the young people here this past weekend. It's been not just encouraging as a teacher. You know, you spend time prepping things, and so you start thinking about the lesson. You think about the material. I don't know what dropped. Oh, that was my Bible. See what I meant about the awkwardness. Uh, but it has been good just to, to meet the young people here and to kind of see the desire that they have to do good uh, and to serve God. And if you weren't here this, this weekend, it's not because you aren't young. It's just because you weren't in college. I think that was the age group thing. So age is relative. So don't, don't start, you know, maybe getting into your head about that. But we had our scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 9. And in Isaiah chapter 9, there's kind of this messianic prophecy about Jesus who's going to come and what Jesus was going to do. That in Isaiah chapter 9, the, the people of God were waiting for someone who was going to come and bring light. In fact, not just a little light, but a great light. Chapter 9, verse 2 says that the light was going to shine on them, that there was going to be multiplicity, that there was going to be gladness among the people, that he was going to break the yoke that they had, the yoke of their burden and the staff that was on their shoulders was going to be broken. And in fact, verse 5, even though it kind of sounds a little weird, is actually a, a good thing that's happening. I don't know if you notice what he says in verse 5. He says that every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and every cloak rolled in blood. So think about this picture. He says it will be for burning, for fuel, for the fire. You get the imagery there? That the one who was going to come and was going to bring this great light, what he was going to bring was going to be sight to people who were blind. What he was going to bring was going to be to fill up and complete people who were broken. That people who the only thing they knew was battle, what he was going to bring was peace. That's the picture in verse 5. And as you read the, the scriptures, what you realize, obviously, is that Jesus Christ is that light. Like, he is the true light who came into the world. He himself says that about himself. He says, I am the light of the world. None of this is a new concept to you. Then in the book of Acts, really, it's interesting, at the beginning and at the end of Paul's ministry, so in Acts 13, and then in Acts 26, Paul kind of says the same thing about himself and the work that he does. He says in Acts chapter 26 and verse 23 as he's preaching, he talks about that Christ wants to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, we would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. That as Paul is talking to King Agrippa, as Paul is talking to Festus, he lets us know that Jesus was going to be the first to bring light, but I think that there's an implication that he was not supposed to be the last. That he was and he is the light of the world. But then the apostles, they came out and they were showing people this light. And I actually believe today that we have a responsibility to continue that light bringing into the world. And I want us to talk a little bit about a passion for evangelism. And that I believe that God wants us to live his light to the Gentiles. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the lesson uh, kind of as this continued light to the Gentiles in three ways. So There's just going to be three big things we're going to look at. The first thing we're going to look at is our struggle with hedonism. I think if we're honest, we don't always shine the lights that we're supposed to shine because we desire darkness way too often. And so we'll look at Matthew chapter 5 and some of the things the text says there about maybe not desiring hedonism. Uh, then we'll look at maybe another struggle that we have with shining his lights. And, and that struggle is we want to keep ourselves from the world by not going out into the world, which I actually think is contrary to what the Lord wants. And then I want us to spend a little bit of time thinking about just this, the unique opportunity that we have to shine His light. And so hopefully you're there in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, Jesus will say, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15, Jesus says you are two things. Really, maybe three if you want to splice it in that way. But he's really saying you are a few things. He says you are salt and you are light. I don't think he's saying the same thing, by the way. I think he's saying two different, you are two different things to help us understand the role and the impact that we have in the world. But the simplest way to, I think, help us understand what he's trying to say is that you have an impact. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, like you can live your life thinking, I can do whatever I feel like doing because no one's impacted by my life. You know, it's kind of people talk that way. It's my life, who cares? It's not hurting anybody, and that's a lie. Because everything you do affects people around you. Everything you do, you're teaching people. Everything you do, you're constructing worldviews in the people around you. And so Jesus will say, the way that he describes Christians, the way that he describes really people, but as you think about this, if you are a citizen of God's kingdom, you are salt and you are light. You have an impact. You ever had food that didn't have salt in it? Like, you know when it's not there. You ever had food that had too much salt in it? You especially know when it's there. You get the, you get the idea, though, right? You ever been in a place that's a little too dark? Like, you know, there is no hiding salt. There is no hiding light. When it's around, it is around. You'll see that you are a city set on a hill. And I don't know how often we think about cities set on a hill. I don't know, Texas is maybe a little bit flatter. Uh, but I think about when I go overseas, and you fly into some of these countries. I remember going to Ecuador, and you fly in, and you fly into Quito, and when you're in Quito, I'm going to start to speak in Spanish, but I won't do it. Uh, you fly into Quito, uh, you kind of, you, you get in the, the taxi to, to, to get into the, the main city, and it's just darkness everywhere, especially if you're in the nighttime, except for like a small little section, and it's just filled with lights. You get that picture there? A city set on a hill, it cannot be hidden, even if it wanted to. There's no hiding what's going on there. But notice what Jesus says about salt and light. He'll say, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, it has become, if the salt has lost its, if the salt has become tasteless, excuse me, how can it be made salty again? Sometimes we can't shine as lights because we have conformed to the darkness of the world around us, or maybe we've reconformed to the world around us. And think about that picture. You became a Christian. Why? And you became a Christian because someone shined the light of Jesus Christ into your life and you said, I don't want to live for worthless things anymore. I want to live differently. And what the Lord says in verse 13 is that whenever you go back into living like you used to live, what you actually have become is worthless. Have you ever thought about that picture? That a Christian who lives in sin is worthless. Salt that has no taste is just rocks. That's the point. You have no value. You're just good to be thrown out and be trampled over. And I know that sounds harsh, but you have to think about the impact and you have to think about what happens when you choose to not live following God's word. That tasteless salt is just little rocks. It has no purpose other than be trampled over. Just like you would gravel, just like you would rocks, it's lost the thing that made it unique. That what makes you unique is the fact that Jesus Christ lives in you. And then whenever you lose that, it harms you. You know, it's interesting. In, 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 uh, in Psalm chapter 37, I think we struggle with hedonism. I think, I, I think we struggle with wanting to live like the world because we see what the world has. And if we're honest, we envy that sometimes. We want to live like that. You see, what, you see how people in their work, how they get ahead? And you know you can't lie like they lie. Or you're in school, and you know you can't cheat like they cheat. And you can't do the things that they do. And there's this desire sometimes to say, well, I want to be like them. But in Psalm 37, the psalmist says, do not fret because of evildoers and do not be envious towards wrongdoers. I think it's easy sometimes for Christians to be envious about people who live in sin. And you may be nodding and you'll be like, no, that's not true. It is. I think Christians struggle with this. To think that, well, you know, back in, back in my day, and this is sometimes how it manifests itself is you'll talk in such a way that I remember back before I wasn't a Christian. You ever had that conversation with yourself? Well, you slighted me. If you had known me 10 years ago, this, was, this would have turned out a little bit differently. If you had known me 15 years ago, I would have handled the situation differently. And there's this desire to be someone you're not anymore. And the psalmist says, don't desire that. Don't be envious over wrongdoing. In the long term, wrongdoing never actually does you any good. I think Christians oftentimes, they longingly look at the 
freedom for any real responsibility that people in the world have. And they think that that lifestyle is attractive. And all that it is, by the way, is a deception from the evil one. That the world is looking at you. And the world wants you to conform. You get the picture of to conform, to take its shape. The world wants you to behave like the world. In fact, Peter says as much. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 12, Peter will say, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers. He comes back to this idea in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4. He says, In all this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. Do you know that the world wants to see you behave like them? Like so desperately. People in the world, they want to see Christians live in sin. Because it invalidates everything that you say. Invalidates all the time you spend here, all these sings, these these songs, these passion for your God. It means nothing to them. Because you don't actually live that. And we have to see how desiring to be like the world prohibits us from us actually shining our lights. That even a little bit of that will harm you. Christians need to stop being filled with darkness. Honestly, we need to stop being filled with what the world wants, with the world's desires, with what the world thinks is beautiful. We need to cast off the deeds of darkness. We are children, Ephesians chapter 5, we are children of the day. Why would anybody want to be a Christian if you don't want to be one? Like, if you're the Christian, and you say, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, and I go to all these extra stuff. But if you don't really want to be a Christian, why would anybody want to be one? Have you ever thought about that idea? If you resemble the world more today than you did six months ago, more than you did a year ago, more than you did 10 years ago, something has got to change. And what's got to change is you. You just hard truth, but stick with me for a second. If you are working a job and you cannot shine as a light in that job for whatever reason, which by the way, I actually believe that people have the ability to change and to grow and shine as light. But if you are working a job and you, you for whatever reason, just, you do not have the, the self-control or whatever to shine as a light, you need to leave that job. If you've got some friends and you know you're supposed to be the light, but you're just, you, you're just, you haven't done that. You need to leave those friends because the responsibility that you have from the Lord to shine as a light. If you're in a relationship and in this relationship, you know, you're doing things you're not supposed to be doing. You need to leave that relationship because what the Lord calls you to do is to be salt and light. And that's not like a suggestion that he's giving you. That's a command. This is who you are. This is who he expects you to be. And if anything is getting in the way of that, you may need to leave. You may need to quit and find another place to work. You may need to leave where you're at and find another place to live. You may need to leave your friend group and find another group because being a light is far more important. And you've got to be self-aware about that. Look, I am from New York City, and I love New York. I know it sounds like if you talk to me, you may think I don't, but I, I do. I love New York. And I love to visit New York. It's home. But the fact of the matter is, is that for me right now, every time I go up there, a little bit of New York comes out of me. You know what I mean? I'm a little gruffer and a little more confrontational. You know, and I know that's not who I should be. And so as much as I miss New York, I know that at least at this point in my, time, at this point in my life, it's just not the place I need to be living. And that's a hard truth, but it's a truth that I need to acknowledge and I need to be real about. And you need to be the same in your life. And so again, think about the idea of hedonism, hedonism and how it might prohibit you from really shining a light the way that God wants you to shine. But, but maybe that's not so much your struggle, right? Because notice what the Lord says. He says, uh, he'll, he'll continue and he'll say, let me just get past this here so we can. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He says, you are the light of the world. He says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Notice anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light therefore shine before men. Maybe your struggle, by the way, isn't to desire hedonism. And if that's not your struggle, praise God for that. Thank God for that. But I think there's another challenge that comes up. I think another challenge that comes up is that we think, all right, the way that I'm going to make sure that I don't contaminate myself with the world, the way that I'm going to make sure that I live as holy as possible is I'm just going to avoid any sort of interaction with anyone who is an unbeliever. Because that makes sense, right? You think about it. Like, think about it logically. 
if you don't spend any time with anyone who is ever you would consider to be a bad person, are you ever going to be tempted to do bad things? The answer, by the way, is still yes. But in your brain, you tell yourself no. Did you get what I'm saying? If you only ever spend time with people here, then you'll think this is good. This is great. So I'm going to make sure that I am doing, I've set myself in a situation and with people where I'm going to be as good as possible. But what Paul actually, Paul, Jesus actually says is that you can't hide who you are. You can't hide your light away from the world. You know that like we live in a world where it's, I think especially in 2024, we have this weird and unique opportunity where if you wanted this to, be, like, to come to fruition, you actually can. Because you can find a job where you never have to leave your house. And in fact, you actually don't even have to leave your house to get food because you can get everything ordered. You know, you can DoorDash or whatever Instacart things. And for entertainment, you also don't have to leave the house because you have your TV. Like everything is in your house. Like if you really, really, really wanted to, you can take all the appropriate steps to make sure you never have to leave your house and you never have to interact with anyone who isn't a Christian. Let me just tell you, I do not believe that that is what the Lord wants us to do. It would be impossible for you to shine as a light in darkness if you're never around darkness. Salt doesn't do any good if it stays in the salt shaker. You will not do any good if the only people you interact with, the only people that you shine your light around is other lights. That's great. That's fine. But you're not really playing the role that the Lord wants you to play. You're going to have to have relationships with your neighbors, with the people in the grocery store, with people in the world, because it's kind of unavoidable. And, and, and not just like from a negative view because it's unavoidable, but because there's a positive aspect that you have to view yourself as I have something to offer. I have something to give. That you have a real opportunity to be salt. You have a real opportunity to be light when you live like Christ around the people who do not know him. In Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I urge you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He'll say, and do not be conformed. Again, we mentioned that word. The word conform is to take the shape of something. So do not take the shape of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will prove what the will of God is. You ever thought about what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2? Who are you proving the will of God to? Are you proving God's will to God? That it's good and acceptable and perfect? Does God not already know that? Are you proving the will of God? Maybe you're proving it to yourself. That the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. Except I think you know that because that's why you're trying to not be conformed and trying to be transformed. I think in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, the picture is when you're living this life where you are not being conformed, but you're being transformed, you are proving the will of God to people who do not think that God's will is good. That you're proving the will of God to people who do not think that God's will is acceptable. That they do not think that God's will is perfect. So let me tell you, the world does not think this about God. You live in a society where people think that God either does not exist, or if he does exist, he doesn't care squat about people. How are they going to think differently if they never see it? If they never see you, just in general? We need to remember that when interacting with the world, by the way, you were once a part of that world. So be patient. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul gives a list in, of, of sins to the church of Corinth. And he says, hey, by the way, this is who you were. And I think sometimes we're so quick to forget our past. We're so quick to forget what God has done for us. And, really, and I think the problem with that is that you forget what God can do for people in the world as well is that you see people and you see how they behave or you see how they talk or you see how they dress or you see their beliefs, whether it's the beliefs about how the world works or their political beliefs or whatever it is, you fill in the blank. I don't actually care that much. But you see people and you think lost cause. And what you forget is that you were a lost cause until someone thought that you had enough value to talk to Jesus Christ, to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And so we start to see people as redeemable cases. As we, until we start to see people as people that the blood of Jesus Christ can save, you're never going to see the value of going and talking to them. You were forgiven. Not because you were great. Not because you deserve the forgiveness. You were forgiven, and that was God's doing. And I think that if we remember that, I hope it will help us have the proper humility and urgency in our interactions with people in the world. 
we can remember that we were washed by the blood of Jesus, it will allow us to have the proper mentality for those people needing to be cleansed as well, to help them with the things that they need to repent of as well. That you serve a God who loves his enemies. And God loved his enemies so much that he sent his son to die for them. Like, that's love. You know that God doesn't call you to love your enemies because they're worthy of love? He didn't love you because you were worthy of love. He loved you because he is love. He loved you because that's his nature. That's his character. That's, that's who he is. And if you're supposed to be like Christ, you're supposed to do the same thing. And this isn't a suggestion that Jesus is giving you. Like, you know, like you might should if you kind of want to, if you feel like it today, you might should think about maybe loving your neighbors, kind of, sort of, but not a little, you know, not a lot, just a little bit, just like it. That's not what he says. He's not suggesting these things to us. He is telling us that if we are going to be in him, this is what we have to do. This is his nature. This is his character. And you may not feel that emotion of love, and who cares? Love is not an emotion. Love is something you do. For God so loved the world that he did some things. And so you can't stay bubbled up and never around people and never talk to people and never use the interactions and the opportunities that you have with people to talk about God. You have to go out. You are the light of the world. What good is a hidden light? What good is your life if no one ever saw it? Imagine you lived the perfect life. I mean, let's just indulge me for a second. Imagine Jesus of Naz Jesus is born in Nazareth. And he lives just the perfect life. Except he never goes out and teaches. He never goes out and helps people. Like the miracles and the signs and the wonders, that, that none of that ever happens. And then he dies at an old age. You fill in the blank. He dies just of natural causes. Now, a perfect life was lived, but for what good? You get the point? What makes Jesus' life so impactful is that he lived the perfect life, but that we're able to see it, and we're able to read about it, and talk about it, and he has changed and transformed us. You need to think of your life in the same way, that people need to see the fact that you are a Christian. And the reason why is because you have a unique opportunity. And that opportunity is opportunity to shine. Jesus says that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under the basket, but on the lampstand. And you'll say, therefore, let your light shine before men, that they see your good works. People have to see. You have an incredible opportunity to be like God. That the world needs you. By the way, you know what he doesn't say? Which he could have said. He could have said the kingdom of heaven is the light of the world. And the kingdom of heaven is the salt of the earth. He could have said the church that resides in College Station is the salt of the earth. He could have said that if he wanted to. That's not what he says. You know what he says? You, individually, you specifically, are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You have Because you will have interactions with people that no one else here will. You know that, right? You'll meet people and you'll talk to people that no one else will talk to. And if you're expecting Jacob, you're expecting the elders, you're expecting someone else to do it for you, that person will never come to the Lord. You have an impact. That's supposed to be the idea. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm a nobody, that's true. You are. And so am I. But that's not the point. Because what you're showing people isn't you. What you're showing people is Jesus Christ. What you're talking to people about is what Jesus Christ has done. You shine the light of Christ. That's how corruption and darkness is driven out of the world. And you're not going to be able to do it to the whole world. But you will be able to do it to your little world, the bubble of people that are around you. You'll be able to shine a light in them. Think very quickly about the person that you think is maybe the best example of shining a light. The person that you think this person just impacts people the best at being salt. Tomorrow morning, is that person going to work with you? Will that person be in your classes with you? If the answer is no, something's got to change. Because you have to be that person. You have a unique opportunity. It's Jesus Christ shining in you. Which doesn't mean, by the way, you're perfect. What it does mean is that you show people that you cling to Jesus Christ. What it means is that whenever you sin, you mourn over the sins that you've committed. What it means is that you're someone who hungers and thirsts for doing what's right. 
that you're a peacemaker, that in every aspect of your life, you're pure in heart, you're devoted to serving God, that you're willing to be persecuted because you don't care about what people think because your aim is to serve God. What it means is to be a citizen of the kingdom. You have this unique opportunity to glorify the Father and join what all of creation does. Because in Psalm 19, that's what the psalmist says about what God's creation is already doing. What God is actually wanting you to do is to join what he intended everything else to do. He says, the heavens tell of God's glory. The expanse declares the work of his hands that day to day, it's pouring forth speech. Night to night, it's revealing knowledge. And he says, it has no speech, nor are there words. Their voices aren't heard. But just by being seen, God is shown through creation. That God is offering you this opportunity to join what he's always intended. That God's creation tells of the goodness of God. Now this has always been the case. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in Genesis 1 verse 26, he makes man. And the text says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You ever thought about yourself in this way? That what God actually created you to be is to be a mirror. Because that's what every human is. Every human is a mirror. You reflect everything around you. You don't believe me? Some of you talk with a little bit more twang than I do. And you know why that is? Because this is how people down here talk. You learned it from the people around you. You learned it from your environment. I very obviously speak with way too much velocity. I know it. It's a struggle. Do you know why that is? Because where I'm from, this is how people talk. You dress in a certain way. You know why that is? This is what your environment dresses like. You behave reflecting the things around you. That's who you are always, humans are mirrors. That's what you are. You were created, actually, to reflect the one who created you. That's what you were made for, was to reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Man was created good to be an image bearer of God. And so, God is a God of light. He is a God who brings light. And light, by the way, shines in the darkest of places. I put these two passages up because I think it's important to think about this idea because you might be thinking to yourself, I really want to shine as a light, but my life's just really tough right now. I've got some real hard things going on in my life. And if God really wanted me to shine as a light, wouldn't he have made the situation a little bit easier for me? You know, Wouldn't it have been just a little more convenient for me? Because that would have been so much easier for me to shine as a light if things were just work out in my life in all the ways in which I hoped they had worked out. And I only put a few, but there's multiple interactions in the Gospel of John where Jesus says things similar to this. In John chapter 9, there's a man who was born blind. It says he was born blind from birth. And the disciples, their natural thought is, well, Master, who sinned that this man was born blind? Him or his parents? You notice Jesus' response in verse 3? He says, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In John chapter 11, the chapter begins by talking about how much Jesus loves Lazarus. That he, I mean, multiple times, the one that you love has died. This close relationship between Jesus and Lazarus. And Lazarus, and then they come and they tell Jesus, the one that you love is sick. He hasn't died yet. And Jesus stays. He doesn't go anywhere until after Lazarus is dead. And then in talking to the apostles, He says to them in verse 15, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. You get what he's saying? I'm happy that Lazarus died. So that you may believe. Would you allow God to work in your life in this way? Could you imagine being that man who was born blind? Your whole life blind. And you don't know why and you're upset. And what Jesus actually said is, well, this was all happening so that people would further believe in God. In John 11, Lazarus gets sick, Lord's not there. Lazarus dies, Lord's not there. And then Jesus says, I'm happy it happened. Because other people now get to believe. Would you be okay with that being your life? 
that comes sickness, comes some failure, come a loss of a job, come loss of family member, come some, some infirmities that you weren't expecting, whatever it is, you fill in the blank, some hardship. Would you be willing to accept some hardship and still shine as a light so that God would be glorified? Because this is when God shines the brightest. Is in the hardest of times. You have a unique opportunity to be like God by shining your light, really shining his light. And if you're here this morning and, and you are not a Christian, I want to apologize for any time Christians have given a bad rep to God. That's not who God himself is. Because God himself is light. God himself is good. What God wants is for you to have a relationship and to be a part of that light. The scriptures say that he came and he died in the darkest of ways to show you who he truly was. To show you that he was a God of love and a God of justice. And then he rose again three days later to provide light. And that what he calls us to do now is to be baptized in him. To die with him and be risen again. Let me just say on the offset, if you decide to do that, your life may still be tough and things may still be difficult and nothing may change day to day in your life. But you'll have real life in the Lord. If you're a Christian and you have not been shining in the ways in which the Lord wants you to be, and you've lost the saltiness that you're supposed to have, the beauty of the gospel is that God allows us to repent and His grace allows us to recover that taste, to recover that light again. And if you can be helped in any way, 